Way back before the pandemic began, I had a question. What does it take for a city person to go country? I set out to explore through photography, writing, and now this podcast. In February of 2020, I recorded interviews with some of the people I'd met in the early days of the Urban Exodus Project, folks I featured several years back at the beginning of their transition to country living. I wanted to see what they'd built and what lessons they'd learned since we last talked. I planned to launch the podcast in April of 2020, the five-year anniversary of this project. But then, (sighs) this year everything turned upside down. And it just didn't feel like the right time to launch the podcast because so much had changed overnight. The pandemic has felt like a bit of a great awakening. A lot of people's values and priorities have shifted. Self-sufficiency has taken on new meaning. Having space and easy access to the outdoors now feels like the ultimate luxury. As the initial shock of the pandemic wore off, it became clear that many people with the means to do so were leaving the city in droves. Drawn by the appeal of rural life and the option of telecommuting, but also just fleeing the claustrophobic density of the metropolis. Recent data has shown that nearly 16 million people have relocated in the U.S. this year, making the concept of an urban exodus even more relevant. So while most of the interviews in this season were conducted before the pandemic, the answers they provide and the questions they raise are more urgent than ever. I'm Melissa Hessler. Welcome to the Urban Exodus. I just get so inspired by new projects and new ideas, and it gives me so much energy to do those. This is Mary Heffernan, a serial entrepreneur and owner of Five Mary's Farms. Building a successful life in Silicon Valley might sound like a dream come true for most, but for Mary, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was missing. Before moving to the country, Mary and her husband Brian owned and operated 11 small businesses in Menlo Park. But when they struggled to source ethically raised meat for their farm-to-table restaurants, Mary, ever the entrepreneur, decided to use this as an opportunity to start a ranch of their own. I first met Mary back in November of 2016. They'd been living on the ranch full-time for less than three years. It was still the early days of building their business, and they had just launched their online direct-to-consumer marketplace. Mary was still running a couple of side hustles to keep the ranch afloat, selling eggs, turkeys, vintage home goods, sheep hides, etc. The family of six was living in a 780-square-foot cabin, where they still live today, although they've since finished the attic, giving their girls some room to spread out. I knew when I met Mary that this was a woman who would defy the odds and build a successful ranching business from scratch. Mary is tenacious with a tireless work ethic and the unique ability to stay on track even when obstacles are put in her way. At the end of our visit, a sow went into labor, and I loaded into the side-by-side with Mary and her daughters. She sprang into action, clearing the airways and helping the piglets attached to their mama to feed. Her daughters sat beside her, listening, learning, and helping when asked. They are as much a part of this ranching operation as their parents— And it's really inspiring to watch. So much has changed since I visited four years ago. When putting together our first season lineup, I knew Mary was someone I wanted to catch back up with. I hope you enjoy our conversation about her journey from city life to ranch life. While Mary's values and vantage have shifted, she continues to dream up and actualize numerous successful ventures from her rural locale. And I'm thrilled to have her join us as the first guest on the Urban Exodus podcast. Where did you get your entrepreneurial spirit? I think I've always had the entrepreneurial spirit. I just didn't know what that was. (laughs) When I was little, I loved kind of starting little businesses here and there in the neighborhood. My grandfather was an entrepreneur and I spent a lot of time with him and he kind of inspired me, you know, to just take ideas and, and make them happen. 
I think I, that my entrepreneurial spirit started early, but it really wasn't until after college that I realized that I could make a living and a career out of being an entrepreneur. How old were you when you started your first business? Well, my first probably official business, I was in junior high and I started a backyard summer camp. My aunt needed babysitting for her twins. And I thought, well, if I'm going to babysit two kids, I might as well babysit the whole neighborhood. So I started this Merry Summer Fun Camp and had up to 20 kids in my backyard each week. It funded you know, a lot of my, my first car. Right after college, I moved back home to the Bay Area and was studying to take the MCAT. I wanted to go to medical school. And while I was doing that, I started tutoring and saw a need for tutors in the area to help kids with their homework. And I just couldn't meet the need of all these kids who needed tutoring. So I hired people to work for me. And and it was then that I really realized that I loved this niche that I'd found with starting a business and developing you know, the name and the logo and the website and finding customers and pricing structure. And I just decided that that seemed to be a better route for me than going to medical school. After academic trainers, um, I started a second location and then a few other family-based businesses in the area kind of just kept rolling. I, you know, we were living in Silicon Valley and the, the boom, and it was really a land of opportunity then. So I'd see an idea and feel like, you know, there's a lot of potential in that for profit and people around here are willing to pay for it. And so I'd jump in and create a new business, kept rolling with that until, and we bought the ranch. So you were operating about nine, anywhere from nine to 11 businesses in Silicon Valley when you came up with for the idea of Five Marys. Can you talk a little bit about what inspired you to foray into farming? Brian had, he was a lawyer in a corporate law firm and had been working with me on a lot of my small businesses. So by this time we were working together and had opened up a few restaurants and we were sourcing really great quality ingredients from local farms. And we wanted to source an awesome cut of meat. We wanted to do great ground beef and our burgers, but we wanted it to have the whole story. You know, we wanted it raised on a small farm, all natural inputs. We wanted grass fed, but we also wanted a barley finish. We didn't want purely grass fed and we couldn't find anybody to supply that year round. You know, it's a really a challenge for any farm or ranch to have product available year, year round to a restaurant. So we kind of got frustrated with the process and just said, well, you know, it's not easy, but there's got to be ways to do it. And if we know that we can buy our own product year round, we think we can make this make sense. So we bought a ranch and thought, let's just do this ourselves with the intentions that we would just be kind of weekend warriors on the ranch and, you know, continue with our lives and our livelihood in the Bay Area during the week. So we started coming up to the ranch and it was you know, six to eight hours, depending on traffic. And we had four kids and four car seats. And we made it happen every single weekend. And we just loved it up here. We loved the lifestyle and working hard together. Brian and I had always worked hard. And we finally had bought the house that we thought was going to be our dream house in the Bay Area. And it just kind of felt like something was missing. You know, we'd have this family dinner in our kitchen, and then everybody would kind of go different directions. And we'd come to the ranch in this teeny tiny little ranch hand cabin that used to be a chicken coop that had no amenities. You know, it's only a wood stove and there's no dishwasher. There's no propane or gas. And we just loved it. We loved the closeness that we felt here. We loved waking up early in the morning and going outside and taking care of our own animals and the freedom and independence that the kids had. And so it, it only took us seven weeks of coming up here to look at each other you know, driving home into Bay Area traffic and say, let's just not do this anymore. Let's just make this our our life and our livelihood. And so we totally switched gears and took a few months to undo the life we'd created down there. We had to sell our businesses and Brian gave his law firm to another lawyer friend and we sold our house and took the kids out of school and, and moved up to the ranch full time in June five years ago. What was the learning curve like for you and Brian when you first started? You know, we relied on asking others. Brian's dad was a farmer in California his whole life. um, And he was really a mentor to a lot of other farmers. He was active in the California Farm Bureau and the Water Board. But people came out of the woodwork who Tom had mentored. 
and said, you know, your dad helped me and, and I'm going to help you. And just, you know, so giving of their time and energy and resources to tell us like, no, you don't, don't put that kind of pivot in, or you can't run a whole ranch on wheel lines. You need to do this. And we're really grateful for the help we had there and just community and, you know, finding other people doing what we were doing, who are willing to share their knowledge and their resources, you know, watching YouTube videos. Like the first day we had to castrate piglets and Brian's like, I've got to do this and you have to castrate the piglets. And so I watched a Swahili man on a YouTube video. It was not in English. And I was like, well, it can't be that different. We have learned from all different facets, but it's kind of been a on the go. When a problem comes up, we figure out how to solve it. This episode is brought to you by Saltwater Farm Cooking School, offering both online and in-person workshops for home cooks of all levels. Saltwater Farm believes in traditional cooking methods and resourcefulness in the kitchen and offers a wide range of classes to help you prepare simple, delicious, and nourishing meals. Sign up for a virtual winter workshop or book an in-person course next summer at their seaside farm in Lincolnville, Maine where attendees gather and forage ingredients from their gardens and the surrounding land and sea. Visit saltwaterfarm.com to learn more. How do you stay positive and push through the inevitable hardships of ranch life? You know, I think because we came from such a different place where, you know, a lot of things were easier in our old life, but We also have such appreciation that we can live this life as first generation ranchers. It's hard to do. It's hard to make a living doing it. There's a lot of capital inputs. There's a lot of obstacles. But being able to raise our family here and to live this life, we're just so appreciative of that, that when a problem comes up, you know, we know there's not many problems that we can't solve when we work together. And Brian and I have had years of experience working together, luckily before we started the ranch. So we work side by side really well. We have totally different skill sets, but we kind of appreciate those. And we both know what we're good at and what, you know, we leave to the other one and we trust each other's judgment. And I think that just knowing that we have each other's support and that, you know, whatever comes our way, we're going to find a way to fix it or to get around it or to overcome it. Tell us how Five Marys has grown since we visited back in November of 2016. It's been it's been monumental growth, really, since since we last saw you. In 2016, we had started our cattle herd. We had sheep and we had pigs. We've changed our breed of pigs. I think we had the old spot pigs then and we realized that they're really tough to farrow. And so we've gone to Berkshires, which are also a great quality meat. We've worked a lot on our pig program. We built a kind of maternity ward outside with these custom insulated farrowing huts. And then we designed a full maternity barn. So we have this beautiful insulated barn now for the pegs to farrow in. We've really focused our attention to shipping. I think we had maybe just started shipping then or we're just about to. And, you know, Brian and I realized pretty quickly that we didn't want to leave the ranch. And the only model that worked for us to get our meats to customers was to put it in a box on dry ice and ship it to their doorstep. People could order frequently. They could order with ease. And that has really become sort of where our whole program has gone. So instead of traveling anymore to do farm stands or deliveries, we're only shipping. We opened this restaurant. We opened Five Mary's Burger House, which after selling our restaurants in the Bay Area and Brian and I declaring that we were done with restaurant life, the historic bar and restaurant in town became available and we just kind of couldn't not do it. It was one of those things that the stars kept aligning, telling us to do you need to do this and we couldn't say no. So we serve all of our own meats at the burger house. We have our obviously our custom dry aged burgers. We do steaks, salads, a little bit of everything. We also distill our own whiskey and bourbon with our distillery partners, Alchemy Distillery. So we've got a great, really great blends of bourbon and whiskey that we have there. And we just started doing Five Mary's Wines with a winery partner. We've got a lot of kind of irons in the fire there. And on the ranch, you know, our our herds are bigger. We're growing a little bit every year, continuing to refine our finishing programs and just really working to get the best quality meat that we can to our customers' doorsteps. How do you divide your time and balance all these different aspects of your businesses? 
it's pretty much a fire drill every day. <laughs> you know, we, um, Brian and I tackle what we need to together and then we divide and conquer on some things, but you know, the, the animals in the ranch are always our first priority and then shipping and getting our boxes out to our customers. We ship Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, you know, getting everything on the truck by the time UPS or FedEx comes, we're usually done with that about two. And then, you know, it's just continuing to grow and, put out fires where they need to be put out and kind of prioritizing one day at a time. Are there any key differences in starting a business in the city versus the country in your experience? What are some of the things that you've learned and the mistakes that you've made growing Five Marys to the success it is today? You know, I think when we were in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley is kind of the land of opportunity. And you can create a business from anything and reach anyone and there's different niches and needs and you know moving from that to a town of 680 i was really worried about how to continue to be entrepreneurial and to keep up a small business and you know especially a first generation ranch we had so many expenses we had to pay for we were like how is this going to work and really it's all thanks to social media like because of the people that we can reach on Instagram and who feel a part of what we're doing, our customer base is endless. You know, you really kind of just switch your kind of marketing and outreach to as wide of an audience as you can. And that's really where where shipping comes in. Locally, I'd say, you know, it's maybe 2% of our business that are walk-ins, you know, locals or people driving through. But most everything we do is online. And that is such a blessing because we get all the benefits of living in a small town and raising kids in a small town and that small town community, but we can still grow and expand our business with, you know, boundlessly thanks to the internet. Did you use social media much before you moved here? I did. I think I had, you know, an Instagram account that the, one of the first weeks they had it, you know, I, we've always been growing up on the latest and greatest technology just because we, you know, all of our friends and a lot of my family work in the industry. And so I had an Instagram account that I used and loved just kind of for sharing our family life. I've, I'd always been an avid blogger ever since Brian and I ha- were engaged. We had the wedding blog and then we had the baby blog and I took photos and blogged literally every day and kind of had a following on my blog. And it was just sort of fortuitous that about the time we moved to the ranch, that was really moving towards Instagram. I like to call it micro blogging because it's pretty much sharing the same information, but in real time and smaller snippets. So I think we were really lucky in that Instagram was just kind of getting to be a thing when we moved here. And it's just continued to grow and make it so much easier to you know allow people to do this. What advice do you have for other small rurally based businesses wanting to leverage social media to build their customer base and tell their story? So that's a topic that I'm so passionate about because, you know, I really believe that anybody can do it and it's not, oh, I'm getting in too late or I only have 10 followers and I can't start now. The time is now. I mean, it's just getting better and better. And Instagram is going to make it so easy for people to purchase products right within the app. And so any business that you can start, especially if you live rurally, if you can reach a a nationwide audience or even a regional audience and be able to get your products or your service to them, social media is a huge tool to allow you to do that. So I've created this course called Small Business from Scratch that teaches sort of three aspects of running a small business, whether you live rurally or in an urban area, whether you're in farming or you have a service-based business or a photography business or really anything, it goes through the basics of how to start and grow a small business. And then one of the modules is just on social media and how to use social media to find that authentic audience, to convert the content that you're creating to paying customers and how to really reach people that you would never otherwise be able to reach. And then the third module is on shipping and selling online and kind of, you know, how to exactly get your product out there successfully and find profit doing it. Um, So you touched based on small business from scratch. Um, I guess my question is, why did you create it? And what is your philosophy on collaboration over competition? I created it because I had so many people asking me, you know, how do you do this? And I want to I want to grow my following or I want to start this small business. 
and I could talk about it for hours, but there's only, you know, so many hours in the day and so many people I could reach. So I took all of this collective knowledge from, you know, 20 years of starting small businesses and wrote an online course. And I do in-person workshops as well, where I share everything I know, because, you know, I really believe, as you said, that it's cooperation and collaboration over competition, and that we're all in this together. And it really only helps us when we can help each other. You know, there's tons and tons of mouths to feed in this country. And the I could never raise enough meat to even take a dent in that number of customers. And so I'm all about other farms and other ranches doing the same, you know, other small businesses finding their niche. And it just makes me really happy and fulfilled to see other people thriving and growing small businesses. What are some of the success stories from the M5 entrepreneurs to date? How many groups have you had come through or how many people have taken the program? I have over 600 people in the course. And They're from kind of all walks of life, but a lot of people in agriculture. And I mean, the success stories are just mind blowing. Like I'll I'll get these reviews or comments back from Brian and we just sit around the fire at night and I'll read them to him. And he's like, oh my gosh, like that is so amazing. And that we've got people creating, you know, redoing their names and their niche and understanding, you know, what they're going to make the most profit from and looking at profit margins and then saying like, okay, you're right. This is the idea. This is the one that I'm going to take and run with. And sometimes it's totally different than what they come in thinking about. But we have people starting, you know, sourdough bread businesses, shipping nationwide. We've got cheese makers and all kinds of these neat businesses that have built a website, created their logo, learned how to do it themselves. You know, the course is called You Can Do It because I really believe that people can do most of this themselves. And if they want to be profitable, they have to, you know, you can't spend a lot of money on a web designer or, you know, professional photos. Like you can do it. You just take your phone and get these pictures as great as you can. And you can build a website in a day and you can register a name and you can design a logo. So seeing them thrive and starting to see sales and returns and really finding profit is just amazing. I kind of preach in the course that a business is, is just a hobby unless you're making money. And um, I think, you know, a lot of people have these ideas to follow their passion. And Brian's advice is don't follow your follow your passion, you have to find something that's executable, and something that's profitable. And if you can do that, then your passion might find a way in or you will lead yourself into this passion. But, you know, just, it's not really realistic to say, Oh, I'm passionate about this. So I want to create a business about it. So we really try to steer people in the direction of, how to find profit, how to think of really unique and creative ways to strategize. Sometimes it's having side hustles and doing multiple businesses. I always advocate for getting scrappy. You know, in the beginning, we were hosting retreat weekends and hosting farm dinners and selling wool and selling eggs and selling turkeys and selling literally anything I could to make enough money to pay for the ranch. You know, now after five years, we've really refined to the parts that make us the most money, but also we find the most enjoyment and the things that were, you know, more work and less bang for the buck. We've kind of phased those out and, you know, graduated from some of the scrappier work. But in the beginning, you know, I I love suggesting all kinds of ways that people can find profit in their business. And again, thanks to the internet, you know, those, those ways are really endless with affiliate links and influencers and micro influencers and sponsorships and so many ways you don't have to have a huge following, but you can grow, you can start slowly and have multiple sources of income no matter where you live and no matter what your business is. This season of the Urban Exodus podcast is brought to you by Jake.art. Bring the beauty of the outdoors in. Search their collection of affordable, high-quality, fine art prints by color or theme to find just the right work for your home or office. Whether you need a visual escape into the beauty of the natural world while stuck indoors or want to send a thoughtful gift over the holidays, jake.art, that's J-A-K-E dot A-R-T, has you covered. What are um, some of the unexpected advantages or things that have come to you through social media that you never intended? I've just been so impressed with the community that has formed around Five Marys in our little, my Five Marys Farms account and kind of people who support and follow the farm, as well as this M5 Entrepreneurs Group. 
when we have hard things happen on the ranch, you know, sometimes it's hard to share those and wonder if you're going to get blowback. And literally it's positivity and supportiveness and people, you know, either supporting our ranch by buying our products or just leaving a supportive comment or telling their friends about what we do or, you know, buying a hat from us if they can't buy meat. But people are, they're rooting for you. And having that behind you is really such a unique thing. And I, I think it's really the bright light in social media these days. Do you have any advice for people who want to build a small scale pasture raised meat business that don't have much in the way of savings or investment partners? For sure. We always say to start small and, you know, you don't want to get out ahead of your skis because it is an expensive endeavor and having a bunch of debt to pay back makes it even harder to, to make, to find profit and make a living doing it. But when you, when you start small and you're willing to work really hard, you can grow pretty quickly. So, you know, like I said before, whether that's kind of having these side hustles and and being a little bit scrappy in the beginning to, you know, maybe start a business that's not your dream business, but it's a business that's going to start to make a little money. And then that will foray into your next business who's going to make a little more money with the goal being starting your dream business. And we do a lot of work on that in the course and kind of, you know, figuring out how you're going to get there, but making sure that you're in kind of a safety zone profit wise, and that your end goal might not be the business you start today, but you'll get there if you're willing to, you know, have a plan and and keep working. What are your hopes for the future of farming in America? And how do you envision more ethical and sustainable food production nationwide? You know, I think the more that consumers, you know, vote with their dollars and are buying from small farms, the more these small farms are thriving. And the pendulum, I think, can really swing back to small farming being profitable and, you know, new people getting into it, not having to inherit a ranch or inherit land, but being able to jump in and say, hey, with a lot of work, this can be a profitable venture and this is what we want to do. And, you know, so many small farms and ranches are already doing, raising their animals ethically and sustainably. And, you know, it's nothing new to them. So I think the pendulum will swing back back towards more and more people able to make a good living, especially for multiple generations. I see that as kind of the biggest obstacle right now is, you know, if there's parents who have a small farm and then all of a sudden there's two or three kids in their families who want to live the same lifestyle, there's no money in it for three families. You know, it's it's usually one family or barely supporting one family or a little better than supporting one family, but three families is like, oh my goodness, how is this going to work? So really look at diversifying and finding new ways to find profit in these businesses, which, you know, might be the direct to consumer option. It might be, you know, opening a butcher shop that supports your farm and supports other farms or a restaurant or, you know, really looking at ways that you can add to the operation you already have, as well as, you know, customers wanting to know where their meat's coming from, where their produce is coming from and getting Finding that connection with their farmer, I think it will be easier for all these farms and ranches to continue to succeed if if and when it's easy for customers to support them. You decided not to go the certification route and instead share how your animals are raised and what they're fed. Do you have thoughts on the expense of the certification process and how it hurts smaller farming operations? Yeah, you know, we just decided early on that we'd been on the other side of it and we didn't feel like a stamp on a package was trust in that product. We felt like going straight to the source and knowing who and trusting who was raising our meat was much more important. And we didn't feel we needed both. You know, a, a stamp on the package does require a lot of extra red tape, a lot of extra expense for the producer and the consumer. And we just knew that connecting with our customers and knowing that they'd trust us was going to be a lot more important. Why did you decide to build your own processing facility? And how is that process going? And what have you learned along the way? And lastly, will it only be for five million products? Or will you be opening your doors to other farms as well? So we are working on Five Mary's Custom Meat Co. And it will be for other small farms and ranches as well. But it's really the Achilles heel of producing a good meat product and getting it to customers because there's so few left. You know, they have to be USDA inspected and certified and a USDA inspector has to be on site for every kill, which is great. I think that's, you know, there's a lot of purpose and reason to that. But 
it's really hard to navigate opening a new one. A lot of the older ones are closing. It's kind of an age old craft that, you know, of being a, a real custom butcher that's sort of dying on the vine. And so then, you know, next opportunity for a lot of people, I think is going to be opening or co-oping or anything they can do to get a custom butchery near them open. You know, people are driving for three, four, five, six hours to get their meat processed and don't really, you know, have much of a say in who or where or quality control. It's just like, this is your only option. So we know for our longevity that we need to control that piece of the process. You know, raising animals from breeding to plate is a huge undertaking, but we have vertical integration in literally everything except the minute we take an animal to the butcher until we get that meat back. It's hard to work so hard to raise your animals right every single day and then hand it off to someone who might not care as much as you do. You know, they're still doing a good job. They're doing their best. Everything's done under USDA standards, but you might get your package back and the steaks are cut too thin or the pork chops are cut without a bone or, you know, the packaging isn't quite right and there's holes and air is getting in and then totally affects the quality. And there's just too many places for air. And so for us, we really want to have control over that for a super premium product. We also want to have a little more control to use more of the animal for our program and for profit. We want to do more of our hides. Right now we're doing our sheep hides. We tan them, but we would also like to do our beef hides. We'd like to do dog food line. We'd like to do more of our ready to eat products like our jerkies and our sausages. So for us, it will really up our game and make sure that we can continue doing this for hopefully generations to come. What are some of the benefits and changes that you've noticed in you and your family since settling into ranch life and building these different businesses? You know, we've become a lot closer as a family working together day in and day out and having the responsibility of taking care of animals. You know, the the kids are, they're really self-sufficient and independent and they care about every animal on this ranch. So they'll get up early before school. If there's bottle babies that that are in their care, they have to feed, you know, they understand that dinner is going to be delayed because we all have to go, you know, help deliver a calf that's out in the field in the rain They are the first ones to get suited up and go out and help dad and, you know, not complain about it. And I think it really puts things in perspective for children to see that there is a greater, they're not the most important things around here. You know, there's a greater need that we are all responsible for. And I've just seen them blossom as young women who are mature and confident and really feel like, you know, if, if Brian and I were out of town and the girls were here alone, they could pretty much run this ranch that, you know, even Tessa knows how to drive the feed truck and they know which animals need to be fed, which water trough, if, you know, there looks like there's a broken water line, how to fix it. It's really been amazing to see how capable they are at their age. You actually wrote a book about, you know, raising girls in the country. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So I, you know, my parenting style really changed when we moved to the ranch And I think I'd always been a pretty laid back parent, but you just, I was more used to catering to my kids' needs. And when we moved here, I thought, I don't really have time to do all these things for them. Like they need to help out. And so they started doing the laundry and helping make their own dinners and make their own lunches and feeding animals and collecting eggs and washing eggs and helping out. And I kind of just stepped back and thought, wow, look at there, they are thriving because I'm doing less it transferred to everything. Like if there were quarrels or, or they would get into a, a little fight, I would step back and just say, do you, you know, do you need some tools to get through this with your sister? Cause it's not my, I'm not in this fight, so I'm not going to help you, but I can give you some tools if you need to. And I just really took a step back and they, they were thriving because of it. And so I wrote um, an ebook on kind of what I learned about raising kids by moving to the country. And it includes a lot of, you know, other antics like how to manage all the laundry and how to let your kids run around barefoot and wild and free and just sort of changing the mentality. And I think it applies to anybody, no matter what your situation is. It's not just for living in the country. It's just kind of my thoughts on raising kids who are more independent and capable and really make the household run a lot smoother because when you raise your expectations of your kids, they really rise to the challenge. 
What hopes do you have for your daughters and their future in farming? You know, it'll be really interesting to see what they decide to do. I think they love the lifestyle. They're all into rodeo now. They're they're competitive in the high school, junior high school rodeo, and they love their horses. They love taking care of animals. I think it'll be interesting to see what they want to do. And Brian and I obviously try to diversify what we do on the ranch as much as possible so that there are opportunities should they all want to, you know, remain in the Five Marys family business. But we don't have any expectation that they that they will, you know, if they all want to go on and do something totally different, then we're happy to support them with whatever they do. But I have a feeling at least a couple of them will probably want to continue in this lifestyle and take over some part of the business. There's a prolific superhero quality to you, Mary, and what you're able to accomplish on a day-to-day basis. Um, How do you keep all of the plates spinning in the air and continue to just smile through everything that's thrown your way? You know, I, I love being busy. I think I've always thrived on creating and I just get so inspired by new projects and new ideas, and it gives me so much energy to do those. I love kind of finding the project and believing in it and making it happen, whether that's, you know, starting five Marys or something small like a kitchen remodel or building out a new mudroom on the ranch or we're working on a new corral and tack rooms for the girls. So I, I just love the idea of creating new things. And I think it it inspires me and gives me energy to keep pushing through and making new things happen every day. What are some of your future goals and upcoming projects that you have cooking at Five Marys? I'm working on a new project in the bunkhouse. We're going to remodel the kitchen and bathroom and build kind of a test kitchen where I can share recipes. It's really been helping lately to give our customers ideas on what to cook with every Five Marys cut. And I've created a um, Five Marys recipes Instagram page. And we're doing a weekly M5 family dinner challenge to try to get families back to their dinner table and inspire them with easy to cook family recipes. So I'm excited to start doing more video and creating recipes and making them as easy as possible to share with customers. So that's sort of a big project up in the next six months. And then I have a cookbook launching in September that will be available in bookstores nationwide called Ranch Raised that I'm really excited about. It's been about a year and a half in the works. Um, Cookbooks are quite the process I've learned. As Five Marys continues to grow, what are your hopes and dreams for the future of your farm? Gosh, that's a big question. (laughs) I think we just hope to continue to be a small farm. You know, I mean, we have, Brian and I have big dreams to create new projects and new things, but we never want to get bigger than our britches where we're not the ones feeding our animals. So, you know, I think one of our dreams is just to continue to live this lifestyle as it is now and to, you know, grow and fulfill those other dreams that we have along the way, but really to maintain that this is a small family farm and will be for hopefully generations to come. What surprises people most about the way you live now? Are there any common misperceptions? People are just sort of fascinated with a different pace of life and, you know, that the the kids are so wild and independent and that we're okay in a small house. I think, you know, a lot of people think that the American dream is to get bigger and save money for nice vacations and buy a bigger house. And I never thought we'd live in this little tiny cabin for five years. And we honestly have no plans of going anywhere, but we found such contentment in this small house and the fulfillment that we find working together and then, you know, going to bed together so close and everybody kind of in the same room. And I think it surprises people sort of that we can be so happy coming from a different life, living a life that's really toned down. You know, some, some people say, Oh, is your life so simple now? I'm like, no, definitely not. (laughs) You know, I think it's really just kind of a life where you get back to what's important in your core values and your priorities really change in terms of, of what's important. A little update for you since our interview in February. A lot has changed on the ranch. Mary has released a new cookbook titled Branch Raised, and she's built a test kitchen to create, film, and share recipes. The pandemic hasn't slowed Mary's progress. If anything, The demand for mail-order meat has increased to the point where they sometimes sell out of prime cuts. 
Instead of scaling beyond their comfort level, Mary has used this as an opportunity to connect her loyal customer base with her pool of M5 entrepreneurs who are also selling meat online. Collaboration over competition. It's always been her motto. There are enough customers to go around. The pandemic has also inspired a new venture, M5 Ranch School, which offers weekly online learning, workshops, and activities for people of all ages. With the pandemic keeping Mary's four daughters at home this school year, Mary saw a need to build a homeschool community and create unique and fun curriculum to supplement virtual schooling. I'm honestly eager to see what the future holds for this hardworking entrepreneurial family. It feels like the sky is the limit. Thanks for listening to the first episode of the Urban Exodus podcast. I hope you found Mary's interview as inspiring and motivating as I did. You can find Mary's Urban Exodus feature from 2016 on urbanexodus.com. To learn more about Five Mary's Farms, go to fivemarysfarms.com or follow Mary on Instagram at Five Mary's Farms. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Urban Exodus. To read more in-depth features on folks who ditched the city and went country, visit our website. And join me next time as I speak to Sarah and Rich Combs, the owners and operators of the Joshua Tree House properties. Leaving San Francisco and moving to the Mojave allowed them to realize their vision for building destinations in the desert where travelers can reflect, reset, and create. In our conversation, we'll dive into how they built their successful design and hospitality business by leveraging the power of social media. We will also discuss how they have found creative and personal fulfillment by taking a chance and leaving city life. Urban Exodus is a tremendous labor of love. If you like the content we create, please consider supporting our efforts on Patreon. If you are a small business and would like to sponsor an episode, please visit the podcast page on our website to learn more. An enormous thank you to the incredible people that have helped make this podcast possible. Production by Simone Leon, editing by Ari Snyder, and music by Benjamin Bethurum. I'm Melissa Hessler, and this is The Urban Exodus. Stay joyful, stay kind, stay resilient. Thank you.